Let's talk about exposure controls. In this section, we're going to be covering all the major and minor controls for adjusting your exposure on this particular camera. There's lots of different options, and we're going to go through and cover the most important ones first. All right, the mode dial on the top left shoulder of the camera is how we control our shutter speeds and aperture. Before we dive into it, just make sure that that still movie mode switch is in the still position. That's where we're going to be for the vast majority of sections in this class. All right, so the mode dial is controlling how and where your shutter speeds and apertures are being set. There is a lock button right there in the middle, and it's the good style that you can either press down to lock or you can pop up and you can freely turn the dial. So if you want to lock it in in a particular place, you can do so pretty easily. All right, so looking at this dial, lots of different letters on here, and this is how we're going to control our different exposure systems on the camera with obviously a lot of them dedicated to custom ones, which we will get to in a moment. Let's start with the easiest of all of these, which is the program mode. This is where the camera is going to set shutter speeds and apertures for you. As far as ISOs go, that's going to be a separate setting. We'll talk about that later on in this particular section. But with the camera in the program mode, the camera is going to set appropriate shutter speeds and apertures according to the light and the ISO setting on the camera. Now, the default setting on the camera, as is on pretty much all cameras, is that it's trying to give you a shutter speed that is appropriate for hand holding. And so if you're on a tripod, well, those settings might be acceptable for a proper exposure, but they may not be the ideal settings exactly for what you're doing. Now, you'll be able to look in that top LCD to see what the shutter speed apertures and ISOs that are being set in there. So it's an easy reference place to take a look. And I will mention this later on, but that stays on all the time, even when you turn the camera off. And so when you turn the camera off, you can still see exactly what your settings are up there. And that way, it's kind of mimicking the physical controls of other Fuji cameras and retro cameras where you get to look down when the camera's turned off to see what is the setting. And then when you turn it on, well, that's where the settings are. Um, and we can change the different displays here with that. And so feel free to play around with that. We'll get to that more in the display section. Now, if you don't like the particular settings that are there, you can just turn the rear command dial and that'll do something called program shift. So let's go ahead and just kind of take a look at our setup scene here. Now you can see in the back of our camera here that we have ISO 80 set. We'll get to that a little bit later, but right now the camera has F4 and a 15th of a second set. If I don't really like that particular setting, I can turn the back dial and I can shoot at F8 at a quarter of a second. That four means one quarter of a second. And uh, this is giving us an even exposure. And if we wanna go ahead and shoot a photo, we can shoot a photo there. We can adjust it so that we have a little bit faster of a shutter speed right there. We can play back these images and we can see that these images look the same when it comes to the exposure. So the program mode is just keeping the same exposure but allowing you to change the exact shutter speeds and apertures that you have set to a different combination. Now the problem with this is that if you uh, move the camera around, it may hold one of the settings and move one of them, and it may not be the combination that you like. And so program is a convenient mode when you want to get a quick, correct exposure. It may not have the exact settings you want, you can dial that in, but if you're gonna shoot anything consistently, uh, you're gonna be shooting a portrait and you're gonna be shooting 100 shots, and you want the exposure to be the same between all of them, that's when I would go more towards manual. But for quick, fast shooting, yes, this does a pretty good job. Now, when you look in the viewfinder itself, along the bottom of the viewfinder, you'll see your critical exposure information. So you can see what mode you're in, you can see your shutter speed. And once again, when it says 60, that means one over 60, unless it has the little quotations after it, in which case it means 60 seconds. And so it is a fraction, even though it's not telling you that it's a fraction. And kind of the same can be said for the f-stop, uh, the f4 setting as an example. Now, if you want to change how bright or dark your image is, that would be called exposure compensation. And that is something that you can do with the button on the top of the camera, though there's three programmable buttons along with the back dial on the camera. 
So if you are in the program mode and you're happy shooting in the program mode and you want to make everything a little bit darker, a little bit lighter or quite a bit lighter, you can do so very easily. So in this particular case right now, uh, we're getting a relatively decent exposure. But if we wanted to change the brightness, let's say we wanted to make this a stop brighter. We have a white table, a white backdrop uh, cabinet that we're shooting here. We want to make it brighter. You can see on the top LCD that we have three buttons and they have three different controls that are clearly labeled there. And so when you press this button, it highlights it to let you know that that's what's working on it. And as you can see on the back of the camera, we can dial in a plus one exposure and it's going to show you right over here on the left side of the graph, whether you're shooting underexposed or overexposed. And you can go upwards of four and five stops. So if you want to shoot overexposed, you can shoot a bunch of images like that. Just do remember that uh, this is something that stays locked in when you turn the camera off and you turn it back on. So uh, you can see it's still in that overexposed mode. And so I'm going to go ahead and get it reset back down to zero. And you can see that it really changes the shading on that graph there so that you know when you hit zero there. And so get that reset to zero when you're not using it. You don't want to accidentally leave that in a position that uh, you are no longer needing. Now this is going to be most useful when you're in the program mode, shutter priority or the aperture priority mode. It does not work in the manual exposure mode because what's happening in exposure compensation is you're just telling the camera to make it brighter or darker and whatever the camera is in control of, and in the program mode, it's in control of both shutter speeds and apertures. It adjusts a little bit on both of them to make it either lighter or darker to do that. So it's just working with the controls that it has control over. So that is the program mode, good, simple mode. Next up is shutter priority. If you have a very specific shutter speed that you want to get to and you want to let the camera choose the aperture for you, Put it in the S mode. You can control your shutter speeds with the rear dial on the camera. This can be handy anytime where you know you want a very specific shutter speed. Now there is kind of a major caveat with this program. And that is, is that a lot of times it's very easy to request a shutter speed that your camera cannot handle. And if you do that, well, you're going to get a red warning symbol to let you know that that aperture is not enough. Now you'll notice that when you do put it in the shutter priority mode, you're in control of the shutter speeds, so they turn blue. So anything in blue is something that you have manual control over. White means it's in automatic. If you know you want to stop the motion of an eagle's wings flapping in the wind, well, you might need a faster shutter speed like a thousandth of a second. If you're doing nature photography with a waterfall or flow of water and you want it that nice slow water look to it, then you're going to be down at around one second in that particular case. But as I say, the real thing to really be concerned about here is if you are going too fast for what you are doing, um, you're going to get that red warning. Now you can use exposure compensation, as we mentioned uh, in the program section about adjusting the exposure. And what that's going to do is that's simply going to adjust the aperture level so that you are getting a brighter or darker image. Now, as I say, keep an eye on that aperture when you are changing your shutter speed, because if you don't have an appropriate aperture, it's going to turn red on you. Let's go ahead and take a look at the camera now. So we're going to move it over to the shutter priority mode. And if we look in the back of the camera, we can immediately see that the f-stop of 4.0 is red. And what that's essentially saying is that the aperture on the lens is not fast enough to handle a 60th of a second at ISO 80. And so either I'm going to need to change the ISO or I'm going to need to change the shutter speed. You can see the shutter speed has a little symbol by it with the rear dial, which indicates that that's how you can change it. So we can just start changing this until the aperture becomes white. And you can see that this is the threshold that it's becoming white. And so you can adjust it here. If I really did want to shoot with a faster shutter speed, I could go in to change the ISO. We'll talk more about this in just a moment and I'm going to bump it up here to 1600 and you can see that we now have an acceptable aperture of f6.4 and we can move our shutter speeds around this range and have uh, the ability to shoot photos in here and getting the proper exposure in here. So just 
Keep aware if you go too fast and you get to that red, adjust either your shutter speed or your ISO to get away from that red because what's going to happen if it is red is the lens will shoot at the widest opening possible and you're going to get an image that's just too dark because you were demanding a particular shutter speed and ISO that the camera's not able to deliver an even exposure on. And so uh, yes, it'll let you shoot and make that mistake on your own and well, you'll pay the price for it with an image that is too dark. Now in theory, you can go the other direction on this too. If you're trying to do a really long exposure and there's too much light, uh, then the uh, smallest aperture on the lens might not be enough. And you would, once again, need to go through the same process of fixing that. Uh, it's much more likely when choosing fast shutter speeds, but it can happen in both directions. All right, next up is aperture priority. This is generally one of my favorite modes for a little bit more casual shooting where you do get a little bit more control. Now, in this case, you get to actually turn the aperture ring on the lens, which has a very nice manual feel to it. It has third stop increments in there, so you can be very precise. It has a, has a good feel to it. This is the way lenses were traditionally controlled with their aperture. Now, you can take a look in the viewfinder or on the top screen or on the back screen to see what your shutter speeds are. So if you're shooting a landscape shot uh, and you want everything in focus, you're going to be stopping down to f16, 22, 32 depends on the scenario in the lens. You want to shoot something with really shallow depth of field to make it stand apart from the background. You can use one of the faster lenses like an f1.7 or 2 or 2.8 or whatever you can get your hands on. Now, in theory, it is possible that you could not have an appropriate shutter speed, but it is much more unlikely because there are just so many more shutter speeds than there are aperture settings. Let's go ahead and take a look on this camera right now. And so, we're going to move the dial over to aperture priority. You can see that we have f8 currently selected because that's what's going on on the lens. We're on f8 right now. And as far as the shutter speed goes, we have a white number, which means it's acceptable. If we open this up to f4, we go to a faster shutter speed of 3 20th of a second. That's fine. If we stop it down to f32, we go down to 1 5th of a second. So all of these are going to end up with a proper exposure with just a different combination of shutter speeds and aperture. I'm just going to change my ISO back down to its native resolution of 80 and see if there's any problem with their aperture here. So F4 gives us a 15th of a second. We stop it down to F32. We're down at uh, four seconds. It's a long exposure, but nothing has turned red on us, which means we're free to set any setting we want and we're going to get a proper exposure. We'll need to be aware about making sure the camera's not moving and it's the right depth of field for our subject. But we have kind of full reign of all the options and there's not going to be an image that's too dark or too bright, or at least more than we're expecting. Now, if you want to use exposure compensation, same thing applies here. You press down on that right of those three function buttons, turn the rear command dial, and you can make your images a little bit brighter or a little bit darker as everything else. As I say, in theory, it is possible you could get some red numbers on your shutter speeds if you're in maybe very, very dark environments or extremely bright environments with particular lenses and particular settings. Uh, but this will rarely ever happen with you, which is why I do like the aperture priority mode is you're just not likely to run into those particular types of problems. One of the things that you will notice about the lens is that we obviously have a lot of aperture settings, but then we have an A setting on most all lenses, not all lenses. And this is going to be where you want to set the lens if you want the camera to take control over the aperture settings on the camera itself. And so that's fine. Now there is at this time only one lens that doesn't have an aperture setting. And this is where you're going to need to set the aperture using the front command dial on the camera. And so if you have that lens or any other new lens that they come out with that's maybe compact in size and to save the space, they uh, take off the aperture ring, you'll need to control it with the front dial of the camera. Now, this camera also has, or at least this lens also has, a C setting. So if you would prefer to make your aperture changes with the camera and not the lens, maybe it's easier to reach or that's just how you like to work the controls on the camera, you can move the lenses over to C setting 
And then what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to control the aperture with the front dial. Now, the front dial is also controlling the ISO. Sorry, spoiler alert. Um, what you can do to switch back and forth is you press in on the button. And what it does is in its current programming, by default from the factory, is that it controls the aperture or the ISO, depending on if you're pressing in on the button. So here on the back of the camera, we can see as we press in, we are either highlighting the ISO or the aperture. So now I can control the aperture by turning the dial. If I want to control the ISO, I press in on it, and now I can control the ISO. So it is a, a dual purpose button that we can use for both of these controls. Now we can actually do more with this button, and we'll talk about that when we get into the setup menu and the custom functions on this camera. Now with the, uh, the aperture's A setting, uh, we do get a bit of a conflict here if we want the lens to be automatically set, but we have it in aperture priority, what is the camera actually doing? Well, we are now controlling the aperture with the front dial on the camera. Now we can have it go control the ISO, but it's just kind of locked into wherever that particular setting is. And so by putting it here, it doesn't necessarily mean that the aperture is always automatically going to be set. It's either going to be automatically set or it's defaulting back to the camera body. It's a a little bit of a conflict with the way the mode dial works, but I think once you get used to it, it's, it's fairly normal and you'll figure out which system works best for you. Now, one of the things to be aware with on Fuji cameras is that when you press down on the shutter release, it is stopping the aperture down in the lens when you press halfway down. So this is your depth of field preview button. So if you wanna see how much depth of field you're gonna be getting in a particular image, what happens is the aperture stops down and it brightens up the screen so that you can clearly see what's going on. And so if you want to know how much depth of field you're going to have, all you have to do is press halfway down. Uh, now this is only really going to be visible when you have an aperture other than maximum aperture set. Uh, this is something I think I might be able to demonstrate if we have a subject a little bit closer to the camera. And the camera is in aperture priority and I'm going to set this to uh, f4 for the moment and you'll see that when i press halfway down there's no real difference because the camera's showing us maximum depth of field and that's what we're shooting at if i stop it down to f32 maximum depth of field and i press halfway down on the shutter release you'll see how the subject in the foreground comes into sharper focus and so now we can see what the image is going to look more like in its final form uh, when we actually take the image itself. Now you'll notice when I take my finger off the shutter release, it kind of slowly changes back and that's because the aperture is not rapidly opening, it's slowly opening. Why does it do this? I have no idea. It's just what it does and it's normal. Uh, so if you want to see your depth of field preview, set whatever aperture you are going to shoot with, press halfway down, and you can take a look and see how much depth of field you're going to get in your image. All right, next up, manual. My favorite mode, probably yours as well. Manual exposure is going to allow you complete control over shutter speeds and apertures. You can set them wherever you want. doesn't matter what the exposure indicator says. You're going to get what you're going to get, and it's going to be consistent. And that's what I like about manual exposure. Is when you're shooting a series of shots for different timing or different composition, you're going to have the same exposure between all of them so long as the lighting is not changing. So if you're working in an environment where the lighting is consistent, manual exposure works really well. It's also very good when you have tricky lighting, unusual areas of brightness or darkness. This is something that is kind of a standard of working for many professional photographers is you play around with a few shutter speeds and apertures and ISO settings to get it set right for a particular environment, and then you leave it set in manual uh, so that you can shoot lighter subjects, darker subjects, and you're going to end up with proper lighting for them. Now, when you get into manual exposures and you start dialing down to really long shutter speeds, you're going to get down to a bulb mode. And this is a long time exposure mode where the shutter will stay open as long as you press down on the shutter release. Now, that obviously would not be a good idea because your finger on the shutter is probably going to vibrate the camera a little bit and cause some blurriness. This is where you're going to want to use one of the remotes that you can plug into the camera. So you press the remote, 
leave it open for as long as you want. You can lock it in, leave it open for minutes or hours if you want. And then when you release it, it turns off the exposure by closing the shutter in there. Now over on the left side of the viewfinder or the monitor on the back of the camera is our exposure indicator. And this is a vertical format, which is a little different. Most cameras have it horizontally, but I like it vertically because overexposure means it's higher up and underexposure means it's lower on this particular graph. This is broken into third stops and full stops so that you can clearly see exactly where the exposure indicator is. Now this does go five stops, which is pretty extreme in both directions. If it is all the way at the five stop mark, it could be either five stops off or more than five stops off. And that's usually a pretty big indicator that you are way off when it comes to exposure. So generally I like to leave the exposure near the middle to start with to figure out what the correct exposure is and then I will adjust uh, upper and lower. So if we were to try to figure things out right here and now, let's go ahead and put the camera in manual exposure. And just looking at the back of the camera, I'm gonna say that it, things look a little dark, but if you look over here at the exposure indicator, you can see that we are minus five stops. Let's open up our aperture to F8. That's a good reasonable aperture. I'm starting to see a little bit of light. Right now it says that we're minus three and a third stops. So I'm gonna work with my shutter speeds to get it closer to an even exposure. This is where I honestly would probably take my first shot and I might take a look at that in playback to see how it looks. And you know, in this particular scenario, I'd say, you know what, I think this is um, a little on the dark side. It should be a little bit brighter. And so maybe I'm gonna shoot this at two thirds overexposed just because the whites aren't white enough uh, in this particular shot. And that's where I think the correct exposure is. Uh, and so that's how I'd play around with the manual exposure. Very easy to work with, in my opinion. Now, when it comes to the shutter speeds that will be available to you in manual exposure, when you have mechanical shutter speeds set, and we're going to get more of this in just a moment, uh, you can go anywhere from 4,000th of a second all the way up to 60 minutes, which I believe is one of the longest I've ever seen in a stills camera, being able to go up to 60 minutes. That's pretty rare that you would need that. Now, on this feature of the shutter, you can set it to electronic shutter where it's not using the mechanical blades to start and end the exposure. It's turning the pixels on and off. And there are a number of things uh, that you need to know about this. I'm going to talk more about of it in, uh, in an upcoming section. But it does allow you to turn those pixels on and off very quickly so that you can get up to 32 thousandth of a second. Uh, now, one of the... Uh, Problems with this is that they're not turning all on and off at the same time, so there are potential distortion problems when you are using this. Uh, and also when you are using the electronic shutter, you cannot use the bulb exposure, which is what I was just talking about. Now there is kind of a bridge mode between these two of the electronic front curtain shutter. And this is where it uses an electronic start to the exposure and a mechanical end to the exposure. And that'll work anywhere from about a thousandth of a second onward. And so there is a combination of shutters that you can use to control your shutter speeds. And this does get a little bit more complicated and I will go through and explain that in an upcoming section. But just be aware that this is why some shutter speeds may not be available and it's that you need to go into shutter type to make a different setting to allow a wider range of shutter speeds available. All right, next up, the custom setting. So the custom settings allow you to customize how you want the camera set up for different types of scenarios so that you can quickly change from one scenario to the next. Now let's just say you were a wedding photographer and some of your shots are done pre-wedding and you're shooting photos of people getting ready and they're usually in darker rooms. And so you might have a setting for that. You might have another one or wherever they're getting married in the church or wherever it happens to be, and it's a different type of environment. But then you also have kind of an outdoor portrait setting that you like to have the camera set. So you could have it set for that, but then you also do some studio stuff at home and you can have a separate custom setting for that. So the way that you control this is that you get the camera set up either the way that you want, or you go into the edit, save, custom setting, and you select the options that you want which is what we're gonna do right now. Let's create a couple of custom settings on how we want our camera to work. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and dive straight into the menu. And we're gonna go up to the image quality. 
and we're going to work our way down to the third page. You can hold down and it will kind of cruise past a lot of things. And we're going to go to Edit, Save, Custom Setting. There's an arrow to the right, so we're going to go to the right. We could choose any one of these. I'm just going to choose number one, and we're going to go to the right, where we get to either save the current settings on the camera. And I don't have the camera set up in a particular way, but you could set the camera up in a particular way and save those current settings right now. And so let's let's just go ahead and do this. Uh, I'm going to say that uh, custom setting one is my simple quick mode that I go to. So this is going to be aperture priority. I'm going to bump the ISO up to 400. I'm going to leave the aperture at 5.6. Okay, so that's kind of how I like just real simple shooting. I'm going to go back into the menu, edit, save, custom settings to the right, custom one. And I'm going to save this first one as the way the camera is set up right now. We're going to call that OK. For our custom two, we're going to go ahead and we're going to, let's see what we're going to do. We're going to edit this. We want to edit or check how we have this set up. Now, in this particular case, I would like to be in manual mode. So I will just select manual. And as far as my shutter speed goes, I would like a little bit faster shutter speed of 2 50th of a second. And as far as the aperture f4, well, I'm going to say that's good right there. Uh, and then as far as the drive mode, this is another option we can have here. Uh, we can be in one of the continuous shooting ones, but I'm going to stay in the still one here for reasons we'll talk more about later. And so those are the settings that I get to set in there. And so if we go up, let's say we want to make sure that our camera is in a raw setting here. We can go ahead and make sure that that is a part of this as well. And so we can go throughout the menu, which we haven't really talked about yet in this class, but you can have different things turned on and off. And this is showing us where we have these setups here. So this is what we currently have set up. So I'm going to hit uh, display back to exit. Actually, I'm going to hit Q to save this. Always look down on the bottom for information. Uh, so it looks like it's saved. So now I'm going to back up through this. And so if I want to see what my current settings are in here, I can just check them here to see what is set up. We have manual 2 50th of a second. We're going to back out of that. And we can come in and we can edit the custom name in here. And so if we want to give a particular name for this, I'm just going to call it A just to be very quick. And uh, AAA. And uh, then we'll hit back out of this. And so we have a custom name for it here, actually. Did we get that set right? Custom name. And then we come up to set. And so now we can see that we have this set at AA. And so if you want to go in and customize these to studio, portrait, outdoor, indoor, things like that. You can have them set up so that you can see it here. Obviously, it doesn't change the name up on the dial, but when you change that dial, it's going to show up and show you what setting that is. And so this is a great way if you are regularly in particular environments and it's very different and you want to make a very quick change from them. Uh, if you're always making lots of changes to everything, then these aren't quite as useful. But as I say, if you have particular environments that you go to and you want to have the camera got all the base settings that you like to have for that particular environment, then that's what you want to have set up. So uh, it's some of, one of those things you might want to take some time to really think about how you like to use the camera. What are the most important settings in there? Now, one important concept we're going to deal with later on in the menu setting is if you have a custom setting and you make a bit of an adjustment, uh, something's a little bit different this time around and you need a different ISO, different shutter speed. Do you want that updated change that you make to be part of that new custom setting as your new default setting? Or do you want it to always revert back to the original concept that you had? And this is a setting that we're going to be able to adjust in our cameras. We're not going to do it right now, but I want you to think about that one right now as do you want it to update or do you want it to stay with the original setting? Because you're going to have that option when we get into the menu. All right, the other third key component to your exposure is the ISO. I've already kind of given away a lot of this beforehand, but the ISO is controlled by the front dial on the camera, kind of by default. 
but that dial is currently programmed to do either the aperture setting or the ISO setting. So once again, if you are wanting to change the ISO, it's the front dial on the camera when it's in any particular mode, you may need to press in on it so that you see the little blue button beside the ISO and you can adjust your settings. Uh, the native base setting on this camera is 80. So let's take a quick look at an image sample shot at different ISOs with this camera. As I mentioned, 80 is the base or native ISO. You can go down to ISO 40 by doing a pull on the processing, you might say, but I recommend 80 uh, for your basic ISO. Now, 80 through 800 looks fantastic on this. You can do your own tests on it yourself to see how it compares for the types of shooting that you like to do. As we go into the higher ISOs, you can still get very clean shots at 6,400. 12,800 is when you start to see a, the most notable difference. It's still going to be acceptable for a lot of different types of photography. And then when you get into the high settings, that's where it really starts losing a lot of its image quality. Now, as I said, 80 is the base or native ISO. You can go down to 40. The problem is, is that you're going to lose about a stop of dynamic range. And so I don't recommend using it unless you really need it for other reasons. You're trying to reach particular shutter speeds uh, potentially, and you're in a situation that doesn't require maximum dynamic range. So wide range on the ISOs, thanks in large part to the large sensor on this particular camera, the large pixels on it, gives you a lot of leeway. Now, one of the options you have with the ISO is auto ISO, and this camera actually has three default settings that you can go in and customize with IS, the auto ISO settings. And we'll get to that in due time. Uh, but you can have an auto ISO set up that maxes out at ISO 1600 and another at 3200 and another at 25,000 for uses uh, in different areas. And so you can have three different auto ISOs that you can quickly switch between. Just remember that that's changed with the front dial. You press in on it to switch back and forth between aperture and ISO, but be aware that that front dial, the push in function and the dial function of it can be customized later on. So if you don't like the way it works, well, there are different ways of changing it. If you want to change the ISO to a button, uh, one of the function buttons on the top of the camera or on the back of the camera or in the front of the camera, well, that will be an option that you can change later on as well. All right, next up, well, we've kind of already talked about this, but I'll just mention it again. Exposure compensation currently programmed to the right of those three function buttons just behind the shutter release. Press that plus the rear command dial and you can make your images lighter or darker when you are in program, shutter priority and aperture priority. Next up, the metering system. Very important to the exposure of your scene. The camera has four different metering systems on there. Most people are going to leave it in the multi, multi-segment system. What this does is it measures light in 250 different segments of the scene, and it measures highlights and shadow areas and comes up with one compromise for everything. And it honestly does a very good job. And that's where most people are going to leave the camera most of the time. But if you would prefer something different, we do have a center weighted metering system, which heavily weights the area in the middle of the frame. And so that's where your subject is. And that's what you want to read. And you don't want it to read the outside edges, well, this is a traditional way of metering. If you want to be very exact on something that is in the middle of a frame, well, you can put it into spot metering. It's going to look at the center 2% and disregard everything else. We also have an averaging option, which just looks at everything and kind of does a complete average of everything. And there could be some unusual circumstance that you come across where averaging actually works better than multi, I haven't found that particular case, but perhaps maybe you will find it. So most people I'd say, just leave this in multi. You're going to be good for most situations. Now, this particular feature will not become available when you go into face and eye detection or subject detection. I think what's happening there, they're not really clear on this, is that they are heavily basing the metering on what your subject is. And so the exposure level of your subject. It, hasn't seemed to cause a problem when it comes to the metering and exposure of subjects. It's just that this feature will not become available when those features are particularly set. 
One of the best ways of judging if you have the right exposure is not that exposure indicator that we talked about. It's the histogram. So once you understand how histograms work, this will give you a lot more information than an exposure indicator. So you can get this to be displayed by pressing the display button, but you got to go into the custom functions to really enable this. So let's go ahead and get that uh, fixed up right here so that you can have this. And so if we just press the display button right now, it goes through a few different displays and I do not see the histogram. We're gonna to need to go into the menu to do this. So the shortcut on the menu is that we need to go into the setup menu. We're gonna go down to the wrench icon and we're gonna come over to the screen setup options. We're gonna to go to the right, there are three pages. So we're gonna quickly go down to page three. We're gonna go down to display custom settings. And this is where we get to customize the displays that we see pressing the display button. We're gonna to go to the right and there's a whole range of different things that we can see here. And I'm gonna go down to the histogram option and I'm gonna press okay to give that a check mark. Now we could check off other things, but we're not gonna really bother with that right now. And so now we're gonna kind of back out of this by hitting the display back button. And so now we see a histogram there. So if we wanna turn it off, we can hit the display button and cycle through the different options. But now it is a part of this display option where we have a little bit of extra information. And so if we're in manual exposure, kind of experiment with this, and we adjust our exposures, we can see our mountain of information as it kind of goes to the left and right. And the way that this is better than the exposure indicator over here on the left is that on the left, we can see that this is a proper exposure. But with the histogram, we can see how close we are to going overexposed, how bright the dark areas and the light areas. We can see the range of exposure of this particular scene. If I was to hold my hand up into it, you can see it's a little bit more uniform and doesn't have as wide of range in there. And so you can see if you're clipping on the highlights or clipping the shadows a little bit more easily. So if you're not familiar with histograms, you want to get very familiar with them because it's a great way for judging the brightness on your images. Now you can also see this when you play back images, and this will be with an RGB histogram, which will show you the individual channels. Now this can be kind of helpful if you're doing, say, portrait photography, and you're photographing somebody with Caucasian skin, it tends to have a lot of red into it. You want to make sure that you're not clipping the red part of the, the red channel in there, and so you might want to make sure that your shutter speeds, apertures, other exposure settings are not clipping the red channel. You may need to make a little bit of an adjustment in order to do that. So just a great way for judging exposure to make sure that you're getting the right thing when you're out in the field, that when you come back, it's all the, the material as you want it with the correct exposure. All right, another way of determining that you have the correct exposure is something called highlight alert. Now this is something that's not normally turned on. You need to go into your screen setup menu options as I did in the previous section and checkbox the live view highlight alert. And what happens here is that as you change the exposure, pixels that are of a certain brightness level, and you do get to choose this brightness level, will show you by blinking at you um, when it is too bright. And so this can be a very clear way. It's somewhat annoying in some cases, so it's not something that most people will want to leave turned on. Uh, but it is something that will clearly show you where the overexposed areas are. All right, now one of the things to be aware of is that when you are framing up and composing with your subject, you are looking at either the EVF or the monitor on the back of the camera. And the display that you see is probably gonna influence the way that you are judging your exposure. Now this is normally set to preview exposure and white balance when you're in the manual mode. So what that means is that to judge the right exposure, you not only have the exposure indicator over on the left-hand side of the frame, you have the actual brightness of the image as you're looking at it. So you can see in this example, as I'm adjusting the aperture, the exposure indicator on the left is changing and the brightness of the image that I'm looking at is adjusting. And I think this is great for most types of photography, not all. For most types where you want to see what is the final image gonna look like? Now there are cases where that you are gonna to wanna to turn this particular feature off so that as you're adjusting your exposure, as I am on the left side here, 
The aperture is adjusting, the exposure indicator on the left is adjusting, but the image itself is not adjusting. This is gonna work best when you are working with flash photography and you are gonna be firing strobes. You're gonna to wanna to be able to see and focus on your subject and have an exposure that is set for your flash. It also might work well when you are in some unusual lighting scenarios or you're trying to create unusual in-camera effects, uh, very bright or very dark, and it's not as easy to see and focus with. And so this is something that, as I say, most people are gonna to wanna to leave on in the preview mode. This is the default setting, but working with flash, working in the studio, that might be a case for turning that particular feature off. It's very important, can be very frustrating when you're trying to focus on a subject and you can't even see it in a particular scenario. So this is a very important factor on judging your exposure and what you're seeing. Now this camera has an auto exposure lock. I think this is a feature that is not really used all that much. Uh, this is a button that can be reprogrammed if you want, if you don't use it. Uh, if you do like using it, well, that's good. If you are in, say, aperture priority, and we have uh, the camera setting our shutter speeds for us, if we uh, kind of pan back and forth, we can see that uh, the camera's shutter speed ranges depending on what we're looking at. And so here at, uh, let's, uh, let's pump this ISO up a little bit just to get something a little bit more realistic when it comes to a shutter speed. So right now we're at an 80th of a second, but if we pan over here, we go down to a 60th of a second. If we pan over, we get up 80th down to a 50th of a second. So if we want to lock this in, we're going to press and hold this button in and we can see exposure lock over on the left-hand side and that locks that 80th of a second exposure in uh, so that we can lock it in and move the camera off to the side and maintain that 80th of a second. Needing to lock my focus in as well. And so I can lock in that 80th of a second. Now, the way that this button works, you can also change the way it works. You saw how I had to do it. I had to press and hold the button in. If you would prefer to be more switch style where you press it once and it's turned on, well, you can control that in the menu system under the AEAF lock mode. And so it's either a press or a switch style that you can set in there. Now, if you don't like the function of auto exposure lock and you wanna reprogram it, then you're gonna go into the button dial setting under the function settings, and you can reprogram what that particular button does. All right, another way of dealing with exposures is exposure bracketing. Now, exposure bracketing was very handy back in the days of film where you weren't 100% certain of the exposure and you wanted to make sure that you got the right one. You'd shoot a series of three shots or maybe more if it was an extreme case. Well, you can still do it here. You can do it for a couple of different reasons. One, you're not sure what the right exposure is or what you're gonna need later on. Or if you're doing HDR photography and you want a collection of images to work with, as a base for creating a singular image. Now, this is actually gonna be controlled in the drive button. We're gonna talk more about the drive button in a future section, but this is dealing with an exposure problem. So, within here, you're gonna go in to set the exposure options, and the first option you have is the number of shots you wanna get. So this is gonna depend on the exposure latitude, the range that you wanna get, but you also have the increment between each image. So traditionally, a traditional bracket series would be three shots, one stop apart. Uh, that's not enough in some scenarios, so I like shooting five, one stop apart. I think one stop is a nice increment. You can adjust it if your needs are different than mine. Uh, if you want even more, you can go up to seven and you can do nine as well. After that, you have the option of shooting one frame at a time or continuously so that when you press down on the shutter release, it shoots through all of the images as quickly as possible. I like the continuous option because it gets all of them in and near the same light, the same timing factor as possible, so there's very little difference from one shot to the next. You might need to do one frame in some special scenarios where you're trying to time something, but generally you shouldn't be shooting things that are moving with this setup because you're shooting several shots and things are moving and they're gonna be different in there. But it is an option, but I think continuous is gonna be best for most people. Now, you can also change the sequence that these images are shot. And the normal sequence that Fuji shoots at, as well as most other manufacturers, 
makes a certain amount of sense, but doesn't look good after the fact. They shoot the normal exposure first and then light ones and then dark ones. I think it looks much better when you're looking at thumbnails of all your bracketed shots to start with the dark and go to the light. You can do light to dark as well. But if you're shooting a series of bracketed shots, it's going to be really clear where one bracket begins and where it ends. And so you won't be getting things mixed up quite as easily there. So I like changing that to minus zero plus. So it shoots the darkest ones first. So let's go ahead and shoot a bracket series here. All right, so I'm going to leave the camera in aperture priority. I've got it at f5.6. That seems good for this particular setup. I'm going to go into the drive mode, and I am going to come down to the bracket option. Now, there are a number of different bracket options. We'll talk more about these other brackets in a moment. We're dealing with exposure. That is the first of the options. And down at the bottom, you can see Q button for settings. So I'm going to hit the Q button over here, and we can go in. And this gives us a shortcut into the menu. We can also go into the menu and do this and get it set up for the type of bracket that we want to do. So the number of frames and steps is going to be the first option. As I said, I sometimes like to do five stop brackets, and so that's what we'll do. But you can see the other options listed there. You can see down at the bottom where these uh, brackets are going to be on the exposure scale. Uh, this is currently set to one third step, which is a very, very small step. Uh, I'm going to go up to a full stop bracket, which makes sense to me, and I'm going to hit the OK button there. One frame or continuous. This is by default at continuous, which I think works very nicely. You'll see how that works. This sequence setting starts with the normal exposure, which is zero, then is shooting the overexposed, and then goes to the underexposed. And that doesn't make a lot of sense to me um, when you look at the bracket series later on. So I'm going to change it to minus zero plus. So it starts at the darkest and then goes to the lightest. I'm going to press OK there and then I'll press the display back to get back here. And so that is how we have our auto exposure bracketing set up. So now uh, you'll notice over on the left hand side you can see five little indicators where the camera is going to shoot through its bracket series. Now what I'm going to do, and this is going to happen a little bit quickly, is I'm going to hold down on the shutter release and it should go through all five images as quickly as it can. All right, here we go. All right, looks like it did it right. You saw it quickly changing. Let's go back and play these images so that we can see what's going on. So let's uh, see if we can change our amount of information that we have here. So in this particular one, we can see that we were at plus two. Yeah, we can still see it here. So as I go back to the previous image, here's our plus one, our normal exposure, our minus one, and our minus two. And so as you back up through your images, you can clearly see where the images go light from darker to light. So you can see where that bracket series is. Uh, and that can be very handy for checking things out. So I'm going to press the shutter release to kick us back into the normal mode here. Now, one of the things to notice is that the bracketing is still set over here by those five indicators over there. So the big mistake that you can make right now is just to go Take a single photo thinking that it's a normal photo because it's going into the bracket series. To turn it off, we're going to go into the drive menu and we're going to go back up to select single shot mode. Press OK and we're back down to a single indicator on that exposure indicator, which means we're back to shooting single shots. And so one of those really important things that you need to remember to turn off, otherwise you're going to be ending up with some really wacky exposures for the next series of shots. So if you want to dive into the menu to make those changes rather than the shortcut that I showed you, you can go into the shooting menu, the one with the little camera icon, and go into auto exposure bracketing setting, and you can set up your favorite bracketing style. So that way it's set exactly the way that you like it to. Another way of dealing with tricky exposures is dealing with dynamic range option in this camera. What's happening here is normally the base ISO is 80 on this camera. When you go into this dynamic range option, you do have to shoot at a higher ISO. So what it looks that the camera is doing is it is capturing a picture of everything about one stop underexposed, and then it brightens everything up a stop unless it doesn't need to be brightened to stop. And so it protects the highlights from being overexposed. 
So looking at the examples here, it's not a world of difference here, but it's trying to lighten up the exposures. And so if you want to shoot at DR200, you need to be at ISO 160. And then if you're going to shoot at DR400, it's going to be at ISO 320. Now, where you might really see a difference with this is when you start looking at the histogram. Now, in this particular scenario that I shot at DR400, you could see where it's starting to rescue those highlights rather than being overexposed. They're at the very top end of that histogram. And so the idea is that it's going to prevent overexposure in really bright areas. And it's also going to lighten up things in the shadows. And so that if you find that you are shooting in high dynamic range areas, that you are challenged at getting everything in without using an additional flash or a lot of manipulation afterwards, this is a mode that you might want to experiment with. Now, it does require you shooting at a little bit higher ISOs, but the ISOs on this camera are so clean, I don't think that's a major concern for most people in most situations. Uh, so this is an interesting feature, and it's something that I recommend that you experiment with. I don't know if it's a straight recommendation. It's not something I would use all the time, but as I say, if you were, I'd say, a wedding photographer and you're photographing um, in the reception hall and there's just there's a lot of low light, but there's really some bright light as well. And you're photographing people and you're trying to raise the shadows, but you're trying to make sure the highlights are not blown out. And it's kind of an uncontrollable situation. You're not going to be able to light the entire hall the way that you want to. Uh, so event photography, something like that, that might be a good area where you would want to use this dynamic range option. One of the exposure challenges that you might have is with modern LED lights. Now, uh, there are a large number of different types of LED lights, and there are some that are, I'm going to call them cheaper lights. They're not designed for photographers. And the way that these lights work is they turn on and off really quickly, so quickly we don't see it with our own eyes, but our cameras can see it when they are set in a particular way. This is usually going to involve an electronic shutter. Uh, and so the way the electronic shutter is scanning the sensor, and sometimes there is a mismatch with the LED lights that you are shooting under, and you're going to end up with this ugly banding. And the solution to the shooting in the scenario is that one, you could use a mechanical shutter and that may solve the problem. Uh, but the other solution is to set just the right shutter speed. Now, the standard third stops that a camera will shoot in, they're not enough to get to that right shutter speed. You need a very, very precise shutter speed in order to do it. Now, what's that precise shutter speed? It depends on the light that you're shooting under. So the way that you would deal with this in the real world is test shots. You want to shoot a few test shots before you actually get to the important stuff. And if you realize that you are getting banding because uh, you've shot there before or your test shots show this, you're going to want to set your camera up like I'm going to do here. So I'm going to set my camera up in a manual exposure mode for the lighting that we have here in the studio. And, uh, you know, for right now, let's get this bumped up to ISO 400 just for kicks. And then I'll adjust my shutter speeds for an even exposure at, uh, let's bump this up just a little bit higher to 800. All right, so I'm going to say that an 80th of a second gets me a normal exposure. If I found that there was banding here at an 80th of a second, I'm going to go into this flickerless shutter speed setting to make a fine tune adjustment. You want to get your base exposure set as I have first and then do this. You don't want to do it the other way around for reasons that you'll see here in a moment. So I'm going to dive into the menu. I am going to go over to the shooting setting number two. And I'm going to go to flickerless shutter speed setting and I'm going to turn this on. All right, so, so it's now turned on. So now you'll notice that the shutter speed is a very awkward 80.6. All right, so we said we're going to get very precise. And so I can now adjust my shutter speeds in very, very small fractions. The overall exposure technically is changing, but not in any significant way. And I would simply adjust this, and I would shoot at a bunch of different settings to see if I'm getting banding in any of these particular settings. Now, you don't want to set this first because it's really hard to go to a significantly different shutter speed. So that's why you do this afterwards. 
And you'll find that when you have a banding problem, that it slowly disappears as you go one direction or the other. And so uh, just adjust from wherever there is a banding problem, then you'll find that, you know, a little bit later on that increment scale, you're going to avoid the problem. Now, this is not something you normally leave turned on. So I'm going to go back into the menu and I am going to turn this off so that when I go back in, I am making my regular third stop adjustments, which is what you would normally want for photography. So this is a special problem solving feature when working under LED lights when you are resulting in banding on your images. All right, there are more exposure options that kind of go more into the image quality options, a lot of color and contrast options. We're going to be covering that more in chapter 12 because a lot of these are kind of exposure issues, but they're more image quality issues. And so we'll deal with those a little bit later on. So as you can see, there are lots of exposure controls on this particular camera. Hopefully that explains it all for you and you can get your camera set up the way you like to work. Upcoming sections, especially the next one on focus, are also really important because, like I said at the beginning of this class, this camera has a ton of features and I'm very happy to be able to show you how they all work. So we'll see you in upcoming sections.